It wasn't fake news, but they were fake animals on a box of real crackers. And when they, the fake animals, not the real crackers, were freed, the news media went wild. The important symbolism that animals are free and the circus is dead. Next on the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, it wasn't fake news. The animals were just drawings on a box of Nabisco's Barnum's Animals. Animals were transported for the last 100 years behind bars. It was time for liberation. The animals are no longer carted around the country in these tiny box cars and forced to perform these tricks. It just makes sense that the iconic animal cracker boxes show free rather than caged animals. So, you know, this is another opportunity for Peter to get conversations started about the inherent cruelty of animal circuses. So it goes a long way to help the very real living, breathing animals escape that nightmare. For Ben Williamson, PETA's Senior International Media Director, this was no tongue-in-cheek respite from the hard news that PETA regularly delivers to mainstream and scientific journalists, which incidentally often gets ignored. But this wasn't, and it wasn't a trifle. Indeed, the animals were truly liberated, and the change means that consumers, young and old, of Barnum's Animal Crackers no longer will be subjected to archaic images of animals locked up in a cage. I think it probably is upsetting for a child who is eating animal crackers to to see the animals on the side of this box. And, you know, if they think about it, if anyone thinks about it really, and asks themselves the questions of why the animals are behind those bars, the reason is pretty upsetting. More on the changes made on the animal cracker box, representing a significant shift in public awareness of animals in entertainment. Next on the PETA Podcast. But first, uh, thanks again for joining us here at the PETA Podcast. Please share a link with your friends and let them know that the animals have a voice on the PETA Podcast. Go to our webpage at PETA.org and binge up on some of my favorites, starting with PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk. She's always good. Hear what she has to say about the issue of animal rights in episode one. And hear Ingrid's words on why mothers on the southern border should never have been separated from their children. That's on episode 24. A cow is a child is an immigrant. You didn't see world this summer, did you? unless it was to protest, listen to Lisa Lange talk about the state of SeaWorld and the move for sanctuary for orcas on episodes 21 and 6. And what of lab animals? If you want to know why the Texas A&M experiments on dogs are bogus, check out episode 9, which explains how bad science at Texas A&M only leads to dog cruelty. That's on episode 9. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode. It wasn't just a change of brand images on Nabisco's Barnum's Animals. It was recognition that the depiction of animals caged on a box was as outdated as seeing racist marketing notions that existed in America's past featuring pickaninnies. The circus is no more. The animals were no longer in cages. There was agreement that the image needed to be changed. And that was a big step for society and significant news. Coming during the worst week of political news in the present administration, the media's attention to the animal crackers story suggests the world needed good news, reassurance of something good in life, and a reality check. Yes, the circus was indeed still dead, and no one missed it. Here's PETA's Senior International Media Director Ben Williamson on how it all came down on the 
PETA podcast. All right, the big news. Nabisco <sighs> changed the design of its Animal Crackers box. I mean, it, it's funny that it, it should have gotten the kind of attention that it did. Did it surprise you that it did? Uh, it's been a huge story for us, so I was really happy to work on it. We really didn't expect to see the wall-to-wall coverage that we've seen. We've seen op-eds on it. We've had radio interviews and television interviews. It's really been such a fantastic story. And, you know, it's been nice to work on something a bit different. Tell me why, uh, you know, how, how it came about. I mean, first of all, uh, PETA had, had been working with Nabisco. Or, or just tell me, explain the, the origins of the story. Sure. Well, Peter first contacted Nabisco's parent company about the boxes back in April 2016. And in our letter, we noted that animals in circuses are trained to perform these unnatural and demeaning tricks through physical punishment and psychological domination. And we noted that the public had uh, was, was completely opposed to the use of animals in entertainment, especially what we saw with Ringling Brothers announcing an end to Elephant Axe and then subsequently a complete end to all its performances. So we sent Nabisco some suggested artwork, which Peter's creative team had designed, which showed animals in a free-roaming setting. And we were delighted when Nabisco shared its own redesign with us, which was almost identical in spirit to the box that is now being rolled out around the country. So, yeah. you know, it's been a fantastic story from from the start. Mondelez, the, the parent company of Nabisco, have been um, super on board since our very first outreach. You know, we've seen a lot of press headlines saying, Peter pressures Nabisco. It was nothing like that. From our very first letter, they've been really cooperative. And, uh, they've you know, this is a great news story. It's a win-win for everybody. And so tell me, for people who haven't seen the old box, I'm sure they, they have some, some sense of it. If, they've, if they were normal, they had a normal childhood and had some animal crackers, or maybe they were vegan from birth and maybe they never you know, bothered with it. But, but describe the box, the original box. The original box has been around since the early 1900s, and it shows um, tigers and zebras, I think, and maybe uh, great apes in boxcars. Uh, so these are um, cages which essentially are transportable. So they mo- traditionally move wild animals from town to town in traveling circus acts. And so the animals were behind bars in these boxcars um, and we simply asked Nabisco to free the animals and so now the box the box packaging has um, animals of different species in the wild so in a savanna setting and it's really right. great that uh, after you know hun- over a over hundred years of the this traditional box um, the Barnum's animals have now been freed. So there's a zebra there's an <laughs> elephant there's a lion a giraffe and a, and a looks like a gorilla there's yeah. five animals and they're all just you know just they're like in a, this tableau right they're like in a lineup they call them barnum's animals crackers mm-hmm. is that but barnum being out of business was that when you first contract uh, contacted nabisco no so our first letter to nabisco predates that but it does coincide yeah. with uh, barnum's taking uh, ag- uh, agreeing to take elephants off the road. That was the first stage in the collapse of Ringling Brothers or the beginning of the end yeah. for Ringling Brothers. So, you know, from that, we noted the growing uh, public opposition to the use of animals in wild, wild circus acts. And um, I, I think the timing, uh, the development of the, of the packaging took a couple of years, but we knew that things were progressing. Mandela's, Nabisco's parent company were very, um, good about keeping us in the loop of health. And we know that this is such a historic, historically significant moment that these things do take time. And so we were very patient. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah. You, me- you mentioned the, the Savannah setting. You know, one person asked me in an interview that I did um, whether the, the packaging was now realistic because in the wild, you'd never get animals like that together mm-hmm. side by side. And I said, well, I'd rather be one of those animals side by side, um, members of other species than trapped in a boxcar being forced to perform these cruel tricks. It's not, it's not going to be realistic in the sense that you're going to get <laughs> five. This is sort of like a, the diversity picture for HR at, uh, you know, 
your favorite corporate, uh, you know, type of place, you know, look at all the, the great diversity here. And so this is animal diversity in, in a kind of an idealized form. But before, you know, this change, did Peter ever get complaints about the animal crackers and the, the depiction yeah, even before you ultimately went to, uh, you know, Mondelez and asked them for a change? Were, were there any sensitive souls out there who were so irate by the depiction of the, uh, you know, of the animals jailed? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we ever received any complaints, but I think the, the reason why this was important for us, for Mondelez to take such a step, was because we've seen remarkable, we've had remarkable success in getting Ringling and and Kelly Miller Circus and Circus Pages to stop animal acts, and of course, dozens of towns and cities across the country have um, instituted either wild animal circus bans or banned the weapons that are used to uh, make the animals submissive, so effectively banning circuses. So we wanted the marketing to reflect the reality. I think it probably is upsetting for a child who is eating animal crackers to to see the animals on the side of this box. And, you know, if they think about it, if anyone thinks about it really, and ask themselves the questions of why the animals are behind those bars, the reason is pretty upsetting. So no pushback at all from them. I mean, it was slow, but, uh, you know, the, no pushback, no, no, hey, we, we stand on principle. This is this is the way we've had these boxes for all these years. We're going to stick with it. No, they were great. From from the very outset in April 2016, uh, their director of global sustainability wrote back to us and said, thank you for this information and we'll consider it. And then uh, several months of dialogue and updates from us on the different uh, different processes that Ringling was going through and the, all the updates that we were getting on the collapse of, of the actual wild animal circuses. Um, and they eventually shared their design with us, which was, as I say, very similar to the design that we'd sent to them. And they were, they were great. You know, some people are tongue in cheek about this. They want to make it a kind of a happy, fun story. It is a happy story. It's not necessarily a comic one. Uh, I mean, you can make it comic, but th there is this importance about a box changing, right? I mean, it's, it's not just some insignificant trifle, is it? No, absolutely. You're right. I mean, since it's our position that since the animals are no longer carted around the country in these tiny box cars and forced to perform these tricks, it just makes sense that the iconic animal cracker boxes show free rather than caged animals. So, you know, this is another opportunity for Peter to get conversations started about the inherent cruelty of animal circuses. So it goes a long way to help the very real living, breathing animals escape that nightmare. And, and it's a, a point of accuracy. We see brands update their marketing all the time to reflect modern society's values. We've been asked uh, specifically whether what we think of the name Barnum's Animal Crackers now, because uh, obviously that's a legacy of a, a circus that's no longer in operation. But for us, we're happy for the Barnum's Animals brand to continue. The name simply serves as a reminder of the b abuse that wild animals did endure in the Barnum Circus. And we've been encouraging people to, to reflect on that and only visit animal-free circuses with the willing human performers. You know, modernization and marketing does take place. Until Peter called attention to it, who else would have, right? I, I think so. You know, we take any opportunity we can to, to make piecemeal changes for animals. And this was a, a huge leap forward. I think people have had a bit of fun with this story because there's no actual animals. There was an Onion article that said, um, Peter's next campaign is to help to, to release animals from the being caged in televisions. You know, I think we've all had a bit of fun with this, but, but realistically, yeah. it's only fair that, uh, that the boxes reflect modern society's values. To date, how many dozens of articles have been written about this? Uh, Goodness me, I, I don't I don't think there are many outlets around the world that haven't written an article or done a done a story on this. It was on NBC Nightly News. I, I myself was on NPR's All Things Considered talking about it. Um, the New York Times published a story, so it's, it's really been across the board. It's such an an easy, simple story for people to get their heads around. I think, and it does offer some talking points as well. So, yeah, I think media is always looking for, for good and interesting stories with a bit of conflict and a bit of people debating both sides. And I think this is a winner for everybody. Yeah, well, also, it's a nice contrast to the kind of uh, 
news that occurred uh, uh, during the the time this story broke. You know, all the all, all the dealings and on the the, the Trump uh, Trump matter and the Manafort and you know case and the Cohen case and yeah, I, I had one. I had one reporter reach out to me and suggest that um, when I got bumped in my interview for Paul Manafort to say that Paul Manafort was trying to get himself, ironically, uh, from behind the bars as well as the animals. So <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite an ironic uh, turn of events there. So, so it's captured the public's attention, the public's imagination. How does this contribute to... PETA meeting its goal? I think it helps PETA meet its goals in two ways, mainly. Uh, the first is we take any opportunity we can to get tons wagging. Uh, we want the people to, we want to spark debates. We want people to have conversations around the dinner table. And something they've seen on the news regarding animals is sure to get conversations started. So we want people to talk about the, the real cruelty behind circuses that use animals. So circuses uh, whip and electrically shock and beat exotic animals to force them to perform tricks. And hopefully people, when they're talking about this, this box, essentially, they're talking about why it's been an important step. And I think the other thing is, as I say, we've we celebrated the end of Ringling Brothers and we're celebrating this redesign uh, since we've seen so many animal circus bands across the US in recent years. Um, it's only fair that the, the, the marketing should reflect the reality, which no longer tolerates the cruel chaining and uh, dragging across the country of animals for cruel acts. You know, one of the things that you uh, mentioned there, the fact that the Ringling has been out of business now for has it been a couple of years now? Yeah, yeah, it was last year they finally uh, ended the shows. And I don't think I I don't see anyone saying, "Oh, I miss a circus." Uh, you know, "Oh, we miss that cruelty. We should bring it back." I don't mm. I don't hear anyone saying that. No, no. And I think that was happening for a few years. Wild animal circuses have been on the decline certainly since I've been in this country, which is which is three and a half years when I first arrived. There were more people protesting outside the circus than there were people sitting inside watching the cruel animal tricks. So it was only a matter of time before the economics of the whole thing just imploded. You know, it's been 36 years of, of PETA protests um, and we finally ended wild animal circuses. There are still some traveling circuses, but we're doing everything we can to, to end those. And certainly the, the economics of those aren't adding up at the moment either. So yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think it's a, a zeitgeist moment, really. We've changed the national conversation, just as we have with SeaWorld. Um, and there are these big tipping point moments that we, we celebrate every now and then. And fortunately, they're, they're increasing in number, thanks to the good work of, of everyone at Peter and everyone who supports Peter. All right. So what is the next brand or the next outmoded, outdated image on a box or <laughs> some kind of carton <laughs> that you're going to trying to change i i don't know are you do you have your are you looking at all the supermarkets scouring the the aisles for some outdated brand or something or what what do you what are you doing you know i i was actually asked this question before and i haven't since thought about a good answer um make my, no mistake about it most of peter's time is spent helping living breathing animals escape the very real horrors on factory farms and in marine mammal parks and circuses. So, you know, we, we spend almost all of our time doing that and, and occasionally where we can doing this bit of good news to help reflect uh, what society now thinks about the use of animals and entertainment. So, you know, our, our lawyers and our corporate affairs teams are, are really busy trying to help uh, living, breathing animals uh, escape the horrors that they're enduring. Um, no, when I do, uh, when I do find the next target for, for Peter's marketing efforts, then uh, I'll come back on the show, Emil, and let you know. Oh, great, great! I, I'd like to hear that. All right, so just a few more questions now, Ben. And I, I know you've been here uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, tell me, what is it like to work in the U.S. and fight for the animals? You were in Europe for a long time. You came here. Um, is it different? Uh, you know, things here, the approach, the pe people, the culture in terms of the fight for animal rights than it was in Europe. It seems like sometimes maybe Europe might be more, have, have a greater consciousness uh, for and a, a, maybe a feeling of compassion for the animals. Or well, what's been your experience since you've been working here in the U.S.? 
Yeah, so I've been in the US now for, for three and a half years. And before that, I was Peter's press, Peter UK's press officer for, for three years before that in London. And I guess the, one of the big differences is just the, the variety of uh, feelings towards animals in the US. In the UK, uh, as a smaller country, um, people generally have a, a similar attitude towards animals. In the UK, we had the world's first ever animal protection organization in what is now known as the RSPCA, the Royal uh, Society for the Protection of Animals. And that was co-founded by William Wilberforce, the great slave trade mm. abolitionist. So it's a, a soup. I think the idea of protecting animals uh, has a long DNA in the UK. Um, so I think the variety of people's feelings towards animals, you've got your hunters uh, in America, you've got fishermen, you've got a variety of people who who think differently than I do and, and that, that we all at PETA do. So there are many more opportunities, I would say, to protect animals in the US than in the UK, where it's much more singular issues. Well, in other words, there's a lot more work to be done in the U.S. Too. <laughs> uh, that's what you're saying. Well, well. So, all right. Given that, how how have you maintained your sanity in terms of your approach? How do you uh, say set your sights for the next target and and try to help the animals day day by day? How do you how do you do it? I think the big thing for me um, working in, in in the media office is that I get to see wins for animals every day. And that's what gets me excited. And that's what gets me coming back every day. Um, and you can see those wins remarkably quickly. So something like the Nabisco News, um, you know, that, that we won that campaign. We, we photographed the box, the new packaging, and we were able to get that story in the press that very same week that we did all of that. So you know, it's, it, having that constant cycle of stories that I can get in and victories for animals that I see every day is what gets me through the the painful cruelty footage that I have to watch as well, and all my colleagues do. So, you know, being able to to see victories is is the real joy of working, for Peter. Yeah, I mean, I guess versus the people who are constantly dealing with vivisection and labs and the kind of cruelty that. Uh, is often sort of like ignored and not seen or not put in the public eye. Uh, but you know, they see it and they're, they're trying to fight it. Uh, you have a little different, uh, uh, course of action there and you do see uh, many more victories. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think a lot of departments feed into my media office. And so they often bring me good news. Um, one bit of good news we had recently in a, a similar kind of vein was uh, Barney's New York, the department store. They held a butterfly exhibit in their flagship store in Beverly Hills. And mm -hmm. we wrote to Barney's New York and we asked them, you know, th th this isn't right. You shouldn't be using butterflies. One of our supporters saw many dead butterflies hanging around the cage. Mm -hmm. And some butterflies had escaped. And the CEO of Barney's New York wrote back to us and said, this, you're absolutely right about this. We won't have any live animal displays in the future. And so we were able to get that some press and attention. And, you know, that's one of the many victories that we have every week that, uh, that make this job well, worth it. Well, as the saying goes, butterflies are free, right? And <laughs> the, idea of a, the idea of a butterfly show, I've seen... Butterflies on display when, you know, like after the fact by entomologists and that kind of thing. But, you know, uh, the, a live butterfly show, that seems kind of uh, unnecessary. Un unnecessary is exactly the right word. You know, there are many ways to promote your brand and sell your goods without putting animals in harm's way. Um, you know, most people don't even think twice about a butterfly exhibit, but Peter's there to remind them that. You know, butterflies, just like all other animals, uh, are sensitive, have have feelings, have thoughts, and want to live out their natural lives free from human interference and should be allowed to do so. All right. Now, Ben, I'm going to end with this one story that I was told that uh, you have a history with another iconic brand, which is McDonald's. <laughs> and I, I don't really understand the whole story. I, 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 I was just told that you have this history. What? What is it about you and McDonald's, Ben? Tell me about that. Okay. So when I was seven years old, 
um, I won a competition uh, that was put on by my school to open my local branch of McDonald's. Um, mm. I was uh, th there was a lot of animosity towards McDonald's in the posh, leafy suburb of North London where I grew up. And so to try and win around the local community, McDonald's held this competition amongst us public school boys. And um, my tagline, which was, uh, why I like McDonald's. I like McDonald's because there's a wide variety of food and my pal Ronald thinks so too. And you have to bear in mind again, I was seven years old when I wrote that. Um, you, you're so that seven, one, but, but you, you probably uh, incurred the wrath, of, the wrath of all the Wimpy's fans. <laughs> I did indeed. And, and, you know, I didn't even like McDonald's when I was seven, but I liked competitions and I liked writing taglines. So, so my tagline won and I got to cut the ribbon on the opening day and a whole load of press turned up because, as I say, it was, they had some backlash from the local residents who didn't want McDonald's in their neighborhood. Mm. And I think that was my first sort of foray into media and into the, the world of public relations being used as a, a PR stunt. Um, for McDonald's. And of course, then 20 years later, being vegan and working for Peter, I'm now fighting against the very organization that I helped all those years ago by asking them to uh, introduce a McVegan burger worldwide. Ah, great. And so now you just renounce all your seven-year-old ways. <laughs> I do, yeah. yes. If I could tell my, my seven-year-old self anything, it would be not to be used as a in a PR stunt uh, as a, a McDonald's lackey and just to run screaming <laughs> from that whole event. <laughs> <laughs> ben Williamson, thank you very much for being part of the PETA podcast. Thanks, Emil. It's been great. PETA's Senior International Media Director, Ben Williamson, a.k.a. at Tofu Homeboy on Twitter, on once being used as a marketing pawn by Ronald McDonald in England as a young boy, and now exacting his vegan revenge in the branding world by freeing the animals, at least on the box of Nabisco Mondelez Barnum's Animals, where the animals have truly been liberated. And that's our show this time. You can contact us at PETA.org and take action there at PETA.org, our website. Find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on AMOK.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa, just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. music is provided by carbon works check them out on youtube and join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA podcast i'm emil galirma